Okay, hello everybody, and uh, welcome back to Melville at 200, uh, presented by the Hemingway Literary Center and Melville's Marginalia Online in observance of the bicentennial of the birth of, of Herman Melville. Uh, tonight's uh, subject, the discourse of race uh, in the art uh, of Herman Melville, is a uh, complex and, and often vexed subject in Melville studies. Uh, on the one hand, there were a few 19th century writers uh, who were more ideologically progressive than, than Melville, and, and few who uh, uh, construed uh, the idea of humanity uh, in, in such an inclusive manner. Much of this was due to uh, uh, the extensive time uh, and experience he spent outside of Western civilization uh, as a sailor, uh, being exposed to other cultures, living among other cultures, and scrutinizing uh, uh, Western culture from the outside in. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are some passages in his writings that verge towards the, uh, uh, the stereotypical uh, on the subject of race. And uh, uh, Ishmael's rhetorical question in the opening chapter of Moby Dick, Who Ain't a Slave, uh, has, has got to be the most uh, conspicuous false equivalent <laughs> to appear anywhere in American literature ten years before the, uh, uh, the outset uh, of the Civil War. Uh, so here to, to help us uh, sort through the different varieties of, uh, of textual evidence concerning racial discourse in Melville's writings, uh, is Professor uh, Michael Sawyer. Uh, Dr. Sawyer completed a PhD in Africana Studies from Brown University. He also holds a BS in Political Science from the United States Naval Academy and Master's Degrees from the University of Chicago's Committee on International Relations and Brown University's Department of Comparative Literature. He is an assistant professor in the English Department and Race, Ethnicity, and Migration Studies program at Colorado College. And he is the newly appointed chair of the Africana Intellectual Project at Colorado College. He is also serving as a distinguished visiting professor at the United States Air Force Academy. His book, An Africana Ph Philosophy of Temporality, Homo Liminalis, uh, is newly published by Paul Grave uh, Macmillan. Uh, we're very happy to have such a specialist in uh, critical race studies to uh, uh, visit with tonight and, uh, and share his knowledge of Melville. So please join me in welcoming Michael Sawyer. online for the opportunity to participate in the celebration of the art of an author whose work has informed my own so profoundly. I should also offer special thanks to Stephen Olson Smith for this kind invitation. Stephen's mentorship uh, began at a distance when I took advantage of the Melville Marginalia project, referencing uh, Melville's copy of Othello when I was working on my dissertation. And Stephen was kind enough to visit my class on Moby Dick at Colorado College in 2016. And I continue to rely upon him as a sounding board and inspiration as I continue to try to unravel the complexities of Herman Melville's thought. Most importantly, this visit would not have been possible without the support of Cheryl Hendricks and Lauren Hershey getting this all arranged. So I'm really thankful and grateful that the hospitality has been great. Uh, before delving into the close reading I intend to pursue in making some claims regarding the relevance of Melville's work for thinking about race and ethnicity, I believe it's important here to foreground the outlines of a methodological argument that relates itself most definitively to the notion that the canon must be decolonized. I don't disagree with that endeavor, but resist the notion that this is generally achieved by subtraction from the canon rather than adding to it in at least two ways. One, through the inclusion of a diverse array of authors, and the second, through the employment of alternative methodologies. And so as Stephen mentioned, in this instance, critical race theory Africana, and Africana political theory and philosophy help us reconsider elements of the canon as currently constructed. This means that a text like Moby Dick, written by an artist with an unmatched fluency in the traditions of Western thought, can be interrogated anew with tools 
designed to destabilize the legitimacy of these modes of thinking. With that understanding, the ambition for this project and talk is just that, to reassert the value of Melville's work, generally and specifically as a complicated artistic approach to unraveling the complexities of race in the Atlantic world. As a practical matter, there's hardly been a time in my life when I was not aware of the story of Moby Dick, if not the fact of Herman Melville as the author. I grew up in a household that understood family classics on Sunday to be almost a religious obligation. So at least once a year, I find myself aboard the Pequod engaged in the pursuit of the white whale. That preoccupation continued in the dissertation that became the book that Stephen mentioned. I opened the text with a quote from chapter four, the counterpane of Moby Dick that reads, quote, what Queequeg do you see was a creature in transition stage, neither caterpillar nor butterfly, quote, close quote. The principal concern of my monograph is to examine subjects, political or otherwise, in transition and to further propose that unstable subjectivity is actually a form of stable, discernible, and active subjectivity. I ultimately argue that the American plantation, as a site of coercive subject formation, is exemplar of the creation of this form of stable, destabilized identity. Further, for purposes of this talk, I propose that there's a point in Moby Dick when the Pequod itself becomes a plantation and is subject to what I term plantation logic. In endeavoring to situate Moby Dick as engaging the formation of black identity in its complex, in its complex relationship to Atlantic world slavery, the text by thinker C.L.R. James, Mariners, Renegades, and Castaways has always proven generative. In this text, James is preoccupied with questions of capitalism in particular of the United States government's response to suspected communists who were also immigrants. During James' internment on Ellis Island, he produced his meditation on Melville's Moby Dick, where his principal argument seems to be that Melville exhibited a complex understanding of Western societal order that was predictive of fascism and other societal excesses that led to phenomena like his internment. In my work, I've taken liberties with James' argument and proposed that when one focuses on focuses on race aboard the Pequod, one can witness subject formation that is inseparable from that on the plantation. And what James reads as a capitalist text is most readily understood as relying upon the labor, real or metaphysical, of black bodies. Melville's characterization of the subjectivity of Queequeg implies to me that he wishes to argue that the human can exist in a state of metamorphosis that presents an alternative analytic purchase than that offered by Kafka in his text that takes up this type of phenomenal existence. What I mean is that Kafka proposes to explore the notion of profound self-consciousness of transitional being as something like being somewhere between physically, if not metaphysically, human and insect. Melville seems to be pursuing an alternative thought experiment that blurs the separation between human and animal and replaces that binary with some sort of continuum that locates subjects based upon race and ethnicity somewhere between savage and civilized. The continuation from, of the quote from the counterpane that we have started with here is instructive. Melville continues. He was just enough civilized to show off his outlandishness in the strangest possible manner. His education was not yet completed. He was an undergraduate. If he had not been a small degree civilized, he very probably would not have troubled himself with boots at all. But then if he had not been still a savage, he never would have dreamt of getting under the bed to put them on. Readers of this text are familiar with Ishmael's concerns regarding the physical appearance of Queequeg. Ishmael wonders at the harpooner's appearance and substantively situates the white man as normative with the addition of color representing a subtraction of the refinement of civilization. The passage continues and reads, and what is it I thought? What is it thought I after all? It's only his outside. A man can be honest in any sort of skin, but then what to make of his unearthly complexion? That part of it, I mean, lying round about and completely independent of the squares of tattooing. To be sure, it might be nothing but a good coat of tropical tanning, but I never heard of a hot sun's tanning a white man into a purplish yellow one. I believe that Melville means to trouble the proposition that being human equals being white. One way to locate textual support for this contention is the close interpersonal relationship formed between Ishmael and Queequeg, in spite of these concerns. Another might be to endeavor to explore the proposition that Melville is employing Two important claims by Plato as the point of departure for his effort to destabilize white supremacy expressed as normativity. In the first instance, I'm treated by the disappearance of Queequeg under the bed to put on his boots. I read this as one in a long series of refutations 
of the imperative to journey above ground to seek enlightenment that is classically articulated in Plato's Parable of the Cave. One can witness this trope in the work of African American authors working to dismantle the very same imperatives of white supremacy that we are focused on here, most notably Richard Wright's short story, The Man in the Cave, Ellison's novel, Invisible Man, and elements of Toni Morrison's Bluest Eye. Melville's gambit here, placing Queequeg under the bed to take on the trappings of civilization, triggers the musings on the part of Ishmael regarding the transitional nature of his existence. This signals what I understand to be an essential questioning of the foundations of the proposition that white symbolizes good and black that which is bad. As I've mentioned here, there are elements of Plato's thought that I argue serve as a lens through which Melville seeks to both establish and destabilize foundational philosophical understandings. The first we have gestured at is that there's a common trope in Moby Dick that reverses the vector that leads to enlightenment. The second where I will, will begin is to propose that Melville targets Plato's classical hierarchical understanding of black versus white that is exposed in the Socratic dialogue, The Features. Recall that the primary thrust of Socrates' dialogue with Features is to disabuse his interlocutor the notion that Lysias' has formulation that, quote, it is better to give your favors to someone who does not love you than to someone who does, close quote, is reasonable. Socrates' position is the opposite requires that Features meditate on the nature of love and its relationship to the soul. In approaching this complication, Socrates describes the soul in the following fashion. Quote, let us then liken the soul to the natural union of a, a team of winged horses and their charioteer. The gods have horses and charioteers that are themselves all good and come from a good stock besides, while everyone else has a mixture. To begin with, our driver is in charge of a pair of horses. Second, one of the horses is beautiful and good and from the stock of the same sort, while the other is the opposite and has the opposite bloodline. This means that the chariot driving, in our case, is inevitably a painfully difficult business." Close quote. It is a detailed description of the horses that concerns our work here, and that it speaks to a robust consideration of black and white that I argue preoccupies Melville. Socrates delineates the, quote, goodness of the good horse and the badness of the bad, close quote. The horse that is on the right side, or the nobler side, is upright in frame and well-jointed with a high neck and regal nose. His coat is white, his eyes are coal black, and he is a lover of honor with modesty and self-control. Companion to glory, he needs no whip and is guided by the verbal commands alone. The other horse is a crooked jumble of limbs with a short bull neck, a pug nose, black skin, and bloodshot white eyes. Companion to wild boast and indecency, he is shaggy around the ears, deaf as a post, and just barely yields the horse whip and goad combined." Close quote. <laughs> Here we witness at the earliest moments of the Western philosophical tradition the explicit reference to the soul as being divided into two, with the worst impulses. Those that do violence to reason represented by physical deformity of which black skin is but one manifestation of physical and metaphysical disability. Reason and the ability to properly accede to moral authority in this formulation are exemplified by beauty in conforming to a physical standard and whiteness. Socrates continues here to develop the notion that love as properly practiced is driven by the, quote, unreasonable, close quote, responses to the stimulus and the refusal of control by the black-skinned horse. The souls of the lover and the object of his amorous intent communicate at the level of the black horse. When they are in bed, the lover's undisciplined horse has a word to say to the charioteer that after all is suffering, it is entitled to a little fun. Meanwhile, the boy's bad horse has nothing to say, but swelling desire, confused, it hugs the lover and kisses him in delight at his great goodwill. Before taking up what I understand to be Melville's troubling the proposition that black is ontologically inferior to white, it is important to offer textual evidence of the echoes of the features in Moby Dick. It is in chapter two, the white, Chapter 42, The Whiteness of the Whale, where I believe we find Melville first echoing the language of the featureless. Melville writes, most famous in our Western annals and Indian traditions is that of the white steed of the prairies, a magnificent milk white charger, large eyed, small headed, bluff chested, and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs. In his lofty, over scorning carriage, he is the, as the elected Xerxes of the vast herds of wild horses. Nor can it be questioned from what stands on legendary record of this noble horse, that this divineness and that, and that this divineness had that in, in it which commanding worship at the same time enforced a certain nameless terror. 
Well, this position, it seems reasonable to make the connection to the features, but what I wish to develop is the complexity of this point of departure allows me to respect the characterization in Moby Dick. The argument presented here is that Melville does not accomplish this by simply positioning the white whale as evil without addressing the question of blackness. He accomplishes this by linking the three characters of African descent, Daegu, Pip, and Doughboy, to this trope of the horse. Of these three, Daegu is the first to appear and is linked to the features in his introduction in chapter 27, Knights and Squires. Third among the harpooners was Daegu, a gigantic coal black Negro savage with a line like tread and a harcerist to behold. Curious to tell, this imperial Negro Ahasuerus Daegu was a squire of little flask who looked like a chess man beside him. The first clue is the, is the recurrence of the descriptor Ahasuerus. The term is employed in the Bible several times, specifically in the books of Esther, Daniel, and Tobit to reference Xerxes. Recall the quote above where the white horse is characterized by Melville as Xerxes of vast herds. The second and more completely developed theme on the part of Melville is the notion of horse and rider in the relationship of flask and Daegu. This is explored in chapter 48. The first lowerings when Flask mounts Daegu's shoulders to allow him to see further while in the whale boat. But the sight of little Flask mounted upon gigantic Daegu was yet more curious for sustaining himself with a cool and different, easy, unthought of, barbaric majesty. The noble Negro to every roll of the sea harmoniously rolled his fine form. On his broad back, flaxen hair, Flask seemed a snowflake, the bearer looked nobler than the rider. Here, Melville alters several aspects of the structure of the Phaedrus, first in granting nobility to the blackness of Daegu, in contradistinction to the notion exposed by Socrates, and second in an inversion of the relative nobility from the rider to the horse. Here it is important to note a distinction that Melville seems to be exploring between types of blackness. What I mean here is that nobility is at the outset considered to be a part of the character of Daegu that is absent from the other explicitly black characters, Doughboy and Pip. Melville seems to have recognized the enslaved condition as causal of a generational or genealogical interruption that confounds perpetual notion of nobility and therefore sovereignty. I should pause here a bit. As I said about working on this talk, I've generally found this point, the relative compare, a point to, relative, uh, to offer relative comparison of typologies of blackness by Melville, an appropriate place to draw the novella Benito Serino into conversation with Moby Dick. As I reflected on that move, as I prepared this talk, it occurs to me that that comparison in many ways oversimplifies another layer of the complexity of Melville's approach to race generally and New World slavery particularly. What I found, and maybe we can get to this in the Q&A, is that Moby Dick is about the theory and method of a particular type of domination, and Benito Serena was about the quest for freedom and its viability in a larger and broader context. This means that it's not a simple matter to compare characters like Pip and Otterfall from Benito Serino, who engaged in disparate though related political projects, have differential positionality along the continuum of enslaved to sovereign. By return to the Pequod, a productive place to start is examining Melville's description of Doughboy and Pip. The connection between these passages and Plato's Phaedrus is made clear in chapter 93, The Castaway. Another aspect, Pip and Doughboy made a match, like a black pony and a white one of equal development, though of dissimilar color driven in one eccentric span. But while hapless, Doughboy was by nature dull and torpid in his intellects, Pip, though over tenderhearted, was at bottom very bright with that pleasant, genial, jolly brightness peculiar to his tribe. Nor smiles so while I write that even black has its brilliancy. Behold yon lustrous ebony panel in King's cabinets, close quote. The explicit reference to ponies in relation to intelligence accommodate the argument that this is about Melville troubling the Phaedrus. Accepting that a careful reading of the passage productively comp complicates our understanding of the discourse of race in Moby Dick as it relates to canonical views of blacks and whites. Recall that in the Phaedrus, the black and white horses not only differed in color, but also in physique. Here, prior to separating Doughboy and Pip into categories, Melville argues that, quote, in outer aspect, they made a match, close quote. Melville here seems to Preternaturally, seems preternaturally concerned with removing the question of physical deformity or even discernible difference from this analysis. Rumor from the Plato is not just color that renders the black skinned horse abnormal. Contra Plato, Melville requires that the black and white ponies that serve as the point of the comparison are equal in development, at least physically, but it's mental capacity where Melville allows for the difference that maps against the black and white horses. 
Doughboy and the understanding of Plato represents the dull blackness of the problematic black horse, while Pip is described as, quote, at bottom very bright. Discursively, Melville has fractured the logic proposed by Plato that renders blackness as ontologically related to inferiority by proposing that within the confines of the color, black, there can be subjects that refute the understanding while still insisting upon referencing white as positive. The way into this complexity is to keep in mind what we have witnessed as Melville establishes the blackness of the African Degu and then addresses the two black American characters in Moby Dick in order to make some progress toward articulating a theory of race and ethnicity in the text. Recall what is at stake in the chapter in question. Pip has left the Pequod and is about is aboard a boat in pursuit of a whale and not once but twice jumps into the ocean. The first time Stubb, the commander of that whale boat, cuts loose and allows the whale to escape. After the first incident, Stubbs, Stubb asserts he is no longer going to entertain the possibility of losing his cord to save Pip. Stick to the boat, Pip, or by Lord, I won't pick you up if you jump. Mind that. We can't afford to lose whales by the likes of you. A whale would sell for 30 times what you would, Pip, in Alabama. It's important to recall here that in the text up until this point in the narrative, Pip has been a relatively minor character and served the Pequod as entertainment that's the bottom of the social order. The presence of Pip as an enslaved black American requires the reader to take stock of the stratification of humanity explicit in Moby Dick that distinguishes between the savage soul and that of the noble savage is exemplified by Queequeg. I just earlier the notion that Melville was also interested in pressuring the direction of logic of Plato's parable to cave. This is exemplified in what I would label as the becoming of Pip that is caused by his last foray overboard. The passage is lengthy but worth remembering for its implication for the arguments here. By the merest chance, the ship itself at last rescued Pip, but from that hour the little Negro went about the deck an idiot. Such at least they said he was. The sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though rather carried down alive to wondrous depths where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes. And the miserman, miser merman wisdom revealed his hoarded heaps amid the joyous, heartless, ever juvenile eternities. Pip saw the multitudinous, God omnipresent coral insects that out of the firmament of waters heaved the colossal orbs. He saw God's foot upon the treadle of the loom and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him man. So man's insanity is heaven sense, and wandering from mortal reason, man comes at last to that celestial thought, which to reason is absurd and frantic, and wield or woe feels them uncompromised and different as his God. This passage is critical for this analysis, it's worth considering in any case just because it's so beautifully written. In the text, Moby Dick as philosophy, Plato, Melville, Nietzsche, the author Mark Anderson also finds an important linkage to the Phaedrus here, but from a different point of entry that employs the platonic concept of philosophical madness to evaluate the character Pip through Plato. I'm interested in how Anderson's gloss in this passage by failing to account for the discursive importance of blackness in the Phaedrus, and then Melville creates an opening for the thinking we are pursuing here. Anderson writes, Philosophical madness overtakes a man whose winged soul prior to its physical embodiment through birth has ascended the high rim of heaven and gazed out from there on the colorless and immaterial forms of true reality revolving in circuits beyond the heavens. These are the originals in which the natural kinds of this corporeal realm are modeled. Thus does Pip's soul in a counter movement descend into the depths of the sea and look on the strange shapes of the unwarped primal world that glided to and fro before him. Here is this counter movement that presents itself as the intellectual handhold for grappling with Melville's careful deconstruction of the platonic knowing subject. Anderson further writes, Plato locates ignorance and delusion in a deep underground cave whose inhabitants are prisoners, chained so they can see only the shadows cast by a fire on the wall directly in front of them. The prisoner who is freed from this cramped and distorted perspective approaches perfect knowledge only as he ascends to the upper world of sunshine. Contrapuntally, Wright, he means Richard Wright, locates ignorance and delusion in, as he calls it, quote, the dead world of sunshine, close quote, above ground whose inhabitants are chained by and to the concocted images of Hollywood and a diluted religious orthodoxy 
which hides them from knowledge of their fugitive passion to greed and brutality, close quote. Pip, rather than ascending spiritually into the air, descends metaphysically into the depths of the ocean and from there is resurrected. This forces us to confront our understanding of birth as giving corporeal form to the soul as it relates to the socially dead, and here I mean Orlando Patterson's conceptualization of social death, enslaved black subject. If we follow Anderson's useful gloss on Plato that emphasized it is the ascendance of the soul prior to corporeal birth that causes philosophical madness of the type that is relevant here, we have to think carefully about Pip, whose soul has enjoyed no such ascendance and in fact descends after corporeal birth. The critical difference is arguably the metaphysical death of the socially dead Pip that arrives at the same time of his at the time of his birth into the enslaved condition. If we take this formulation seriously, Melville understands Pip to have been born already dead, and that he is corporeally alive yet metaphysically dead with respect to his soul and social status. It is the second death through descent to the depths of the ocean that births a new Pip, and it is the death of the black horse slash soul of Pip that positions him to have a prescient form of being that is best understood as godlike. It is imperative to keep track of the absolute reputation of Plato explicit here in the death of the soul of Pip. Anderson, in his text, draws attention to the normative understanding presented by Plato by marking the second speech of Socrates and his understanding of love as it relates to madness. The madness of Pip, that we can accept as philosophical in the Platonic sense, is also a product of a subject that is distinctly different from the normative subject and Plato. The point is return to the Pequod, Pip, who is generally ignored by Ahab, attracts his attention. This attention must be understood as closely related to the central problematic of the Phaedrus, understanding love as it expressed between grown men and young boys. Pip, who is the former socially dead subject, like the description of Queequeg's marginalization, in spite of his nobility and utility, would find himself likewise excluded physically and metaphysically from places of authority until this becoming. Recall the lines from chapter 12, biographical. Quote, this fine young savage Queequeg, the sea prince of Wales, never saw the captain's cabin. Close quote. In contrast, upon the drowning of a soul, Pip finds himself a resident of, of Ahab's inner sanctum. This is Ahab speaking. Uh, there can be no hearts above this snow line. O ye frozen heavens, Look down here, ye did beget this luckless child and have abandoned him. Ye creative libertines, here boy, Ahab's cabin shall be Pip's home henceforth while Ahab lives. Thou touchest my innermost center, boy. Thou art tied to me by cords woven of my heartstrings. <clears throat> Come, let's down. Close quote. At the end of this all, we return to the point of the conversation between Socrates and Phaedrus, the love of an adult for a handsome boy. What Melville has done is extracted the imperative of a dialectical relationship between rationality and irrationality that is embodied as white and black and complicated things by rendering the object of Ahab's lust, the irrational spirit itself, become godlike and rational, thereby rendering unresolvable the relationship between the black soul and the captain's evil one. Further, it's upon the introduction of the reborn Pip that the plantation logic of the Pequot is exposed. There's a significant patch of what I like to call intellectual black ice here, namely in the undeniable presence of Hegel's master-slave dialectic from the phenomenology that emphasizes the reliance of the master upon the slave and further situates the margin as the vehicle to absolute knowing. But that's another talk for another time. Here we can head for the close by rendering explicit the presence of the plantation at this point aboard the Pequod. Referring back to C.L.R. James <coughs> Anders, Renegades, and Castaways, he writes, quote, the most abased of all the crew on board is Pip, a little Negro from Alabama, the lowest of the low in America of 1851. It is Pip, who in the end will be hailed as the greatest hero of all, close quote. What I read as heroic about Pip is best understood by erasing the authors, Plato and Melville, from the equation and allowing the characters, Socrates and Pip, to meet alone outside of the walls of the city and have discourse. And considering this fictionalized account involving fictional characters, we have to first wonder what Socrates would make of little Alabama Negro Pip who arrives outside of the city already spiritually and socially dead and resurrected to the level of perceptive understanding through being possessed by the gods. It is likely the phenotype of Pip would allow Socrates to presuppose him as representative of the bad horse that is incapable of reason. There's every reason to believe that Pip will be viewed as a slave and as such it is clear from the text of the Phaedrus 
Socrates would be likely to refuse discourse on that basis. What I mean here is that Socrates equates silence and indolence with enslaved, as made clear in line 259b of the Phaedrus. And if they saw the two of us avoiding conversation mid at midday like most people, diverted by their song and sluggish of mind, nodding off, they would have every right to laugh at us, convinced that a pair of slaves had come to their resting place to sleep like sheep gathering around in the spring in the afternoon. Close quote. This is fair to see beyond the black, beyond the spectacle of physical blackness as indicative of a deleterious and marginalized soul. I argue is the point of Melville's careful, dis careful dismantling of the central message of the Phaedrus. Recall from the text of Moby Dick the complexity of the relationship between Ahab and the resurrected Pip. In chapter 129, the cabinet witnesses Ahab struggling with his own madness that serves as the engine of his monomania when he confronted with the madness or enlightenment of Pip. The conversation between the two is rich with its implication for this argument. Melville writes, this is Ahab speaking. Oh, spite of a million villains, this makes me a bigot in the faithless fidelity of man, and a black and crazy. But methinks like cures like applies to him too, he grows so sane again. And then Pip answers, They tell me, sir, that Stubb did once desert poor little Pip, whose drowned bones now show white for all the blackness of his living skin. But I will never desert thee, sir, as Stubb did him, sir, I must go with ye. Close quote. In the recently prepared Norton critical edition of Moby Dick, the term bigot is footnoted and defined as, quote, a fanatical believer. My concern here is that this gloss of term tends to confuse the argument that Melville was making. Ahab is not just a fanatical believer in the general sense of the term, but specifically fanatical in his belief in the inferiority of the black subject. This text seems to make this clear. The importance of this particular understanding of the term is central to the argument presented here. It is not that Ahab is fanatical in his beliefs generally, it is that the appearance of a particular form of platonic madness as exposed in the features should tend to mitigate rather than deepen his monomania, while at the same time it undermines the very foundation of his understanding of social order, the nature of the soul, and, the, and his expertise as a practitioner of, of rhetoric. Socrates delineates two types of madness in his dialogue with Phaedrus. Socrates says, and there are two kinds of madness, one produced by human illness, the other by divine inspired release from normally accepted behavior. And Phaedrus answers, certainly. Socrates says, we also distinguish four parts within the divine kind and connected them to the four gods, having attributed the inspiration of the prophet to Apollo, of the mystic to Dionysus, of the poet to the muses, and the fourth part of madness to Aphrodite and to love, who said that the madness of love is the best. We use a certain image to describe love's passion. Perhaps it's had a measure of truth in it, though it may also have led us astray. Pip, in my reading, represents a divinely inspired fourth type of madness or love. Ahab is arguably a victim of madness brought on by illness, that being his dismemberment at the hands of Moby Dick. The problem faced by Ahab is his bigotry, an inability to confront the appearance of Socrates' bad horse or black horse as he embodied Pip, who he understands is the lowest of the low, but for whom upon the drowning of the enslaved soul becomes the embodiment of love. What is important here is to mark the confusion this implosion of the logic of white supremacy causes within the larger context of discourse as explicated and promoted in the Phaedrus. As the dialogue comes to a close, recall that Socrates emphasized the imperative that in making effective speeches, the speaker must first, quote, know the truth concerning everything you are speaking and writing about, close quote. It is, second, it is the second component of the effective speaker that is of primary importance here. Quote, second, you must understand the nature of the soul. Along the same lines, you must determine which kind of speech is appropriate to each kind of soul. Prepare and arrange your speech accordingly and offer a complex and elaborate speech to a complex soul and a simple speech to a simple one. Close quote. Ahab, at this point, is the captain of the Pequod, a complex vessel designed, built, and outfitted as a tool of capitalist production, has effectively used speech to alter the purpose of the voyage to suit his monomania. Recall from chapter 36, quarter deck, Ahab's exhortation, quote, death to Moby Dick, God hunt us all if we do not hunt Moby Dick to his death, close quote. His ability to reimagine the purpose of the voyage and achieve the buy-in of even the first mate Starbuck, who recognizes the madness of the message and messenger, but is impotent dis to disabuse the crew of its momentum, demonstrates his expertise as a speaker who understands his audience by recognition of the soul of the listener. 
Ahab has no such ability to accomplish this when he encounters the new Pip because of Pip's black skin, which belies his divine madness, love, and ontological rationality. But what of the plantation? We might find it useful again to consider the implication of Pip finding himself overboard and return to the Pequod. Here I see this incident as an echo of the Middle Passage that serves as the mecha mechanism for transforming kidnapped bodies into the enslaved. Pip the Alabama Negro is not in Alabama. He is aboard the Pequod, a ship from non-slaveholding New England. It is only upon his drowning and return to the ship as a reborn subject that we witness the possibility of Ahab's monomania coming to rest in the seat of power occupied by the master over the enslaved. This includes the ability of black bodies to be abused in this environment. In this case, the ability to recognize the intellect of Pip is the last breaking point that leads to the ultimate destruction of Ahab, his crew, and his ship. It is bigotry, plain and simple, that prevents Ahab saving himself and the crew of the Pequot from a confrontation with the white whale that will prove the undoing of them all. This exposure of bigotry as the fault line of the ethos of Ahab is the message of Melville's text here and why James, in his careful reading of it, understood Pip, the Negro slave from Alabama, as the ultimate hero, who even in his failure to derail the trajectory of Ahab's infectious madness, progresses our understanding by underscoring the bigot as the ultimate obstruction to expansive notions of democracy. Thank you. Stephen was saying is that Melville's uh, a kind of human subject who experiences things and then takes that as, as lessons, right? So his living in the South Seas, et cetera, caused him to think a certain thing. And I think if he had lived through, you know, 100 years forward, he would have seen the world differently, perhaps. Or it may have just reified what he sees in the first place, right? There's an argument to be made that most none of this has changed substantively, right? And so uh, in that way, I think that it, it's probably best to think of Melville as a really um, accomplished descriptor of the machine of American democracy that witnesses how race plays in it. He understands what it produces. And to the extent that that machine doesn't alter itself kind of fundamentally, it's going to continue to produce the same uh, products. So I think that's probably what he was arguing in these years kind of prior to the Civil War. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I have personal experiences with uh, people who had to play both sides of a race issue. And uh, uh, it's a terrible way to live, really, but uh, my father was like that. Um, and I'm a little bit surprised that there was, uh, you know, see, I'm, not a, I'm not a Melville expert by any means. I read the book one time and it profoundly affected me. And uh, so I came to it. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, I think that's the kind of power of the text that it can, it has, it's transportable to different times and spaces in that way. So the fact that it affected you is probably, you know, more important than the fact that you don't consider yourself an expert on it. I don't think anybody really um, would consider myself an expert on it by any stretch of imagination. Yes. Yeah, um, thank you for this talk. It was really great. And I have read Moby Dick a couple times, but it's been a while. But I remember it, that scene about Pip going down into the depths of the ocean, if you will, and resurrecting. There, isn't there another scene where Queequeg is like in that, where somebody's in the whale head and the whale head is sinking, and then sure. somebody dives in and saves them and brings them out? 
do you see, are those similarly that it sort of seems resurrection or is there something different happening in that scene that's happening in the picture? No, I think that's, I think what I mentioned, that I think there's several places where he's reversing this vector and kind of troubling Plato's notion of up and out as opposed to down, right? right? So under the bed with the boots, into the whale's head, et cetera. I think that's probably the same argument I'm making and, mm -hmm. and we'd have to like, you know, closer we got section, but I think it's, it's very similar. Right. You know, anytime, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's kind of this, it's one of those kind of, you know, hit the desk twice whenever something's going down instead of up to like seek enlightenment, it seems, you know, because the fundamental argument from just how the parable of the cave is so ubiquitous, I and mean, you can ask fourth graders about the parable of the cave, right. Right? Right. just a Western kind of thought. Just a couple of, I guess, kind of uh, related questions. I didn't take notes, so uh, sorry if I'm no. a little vague on some of these points. Um, so, yeah, I think way back when, when I had you know, met Moby Dick in a classroom, it was the Pequot as a, as a microcosm of America. Sure. Uh, but you talked about it as a, a plantation model as well. And so I was just wondering as well, I thought that was interesting because you just made the point that, of course, at least from New England, they're not slave the state. So, mm -hmm. what does that mean, right, within that kind of dialectic that? It's a plantation sort of model on the ship, and yet it comes from the north, you know? So that was part of it. And the second was that you were talking about um, sort of subjectivity of those black characters or the slaves on a plantation. And you talked about it as fragmented, but, but still stable or something like that. Yeah. I was kind of interested in, in that. Where Where is the agency then for a pip and those, and those characters within that space of the north, supposedly, but still in that plantation model? You know? Right, um, start with the first question. This, this notion of New England is important, right? Because you see the same thing in Benito Serino where the, the ship is, is from New England as well. And so I think the argument he's making this is kind of, and this gets to this who's not a slave argument, the question is what's not a plantation maybe in the kind of American experiment. That's what I'm saying is his, his kind of uh, interlocutor helps us understand the actual machinery and, and how important slavery is in the context where New England also is implicated in this argument. Because if you remember Benito Serino, there's a point when uh, the person tries to buy Babo, right? He's supposed to be from, you know, he's like, how much for him, right? It's like, you know, now it's like he's invested in buying human, black human, human bodies as well, right? Because it seems like the right thing to do. And so I think that's probably the kind of constant resonance of this, and, and that's what I'm arguing is Melville's, uh, one of the power, the power in his text is that he's saying, he's making an argument about the Atlantic world kind of broadly considered that it is basically a plantation. And so that's another way to kind of get at this who isn't a slave because then it situates it as hierarchically. There, you know, there's a position that someone has to occupy, that some subject has to occupy in this enslaved position, and that can be various depending upon uh, particular cultural context and availability. Yeah, because you're kind of rescuing when, when Steve was mentioning it as a false equivalency, but the way you could read it is, is what you're doing, right? Yeah, it's I think it's structurally it's, on this kind of field within this sort of racist capitalist production. You're going to have these different positions. Yeah, and, and I think that again is is why it's it's such an important text and such an important writer because right? you can read it on multiple levels. He gives you that, you know, baseline. You can, you say, yeah, that's a, that's a kind of dumb thing to say, right? But then as you kind of parse through it, you get to see that there's an argument to be made that what the machinery of America requires is kind of unfree uh, positionality in order to articulate something like freedom, and it's always there and keeps replicating itself over and over again in different environments. Um, Second question was on about the subjectivity of being both right, stable and destabilized. Uh, something like 350 pages on that. This book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. You can yeah, yeah, I can I mean, distill it down. It just, it was just three minutes. Three minutes, three minutes yeah, or less. You don't have to go there no, no, I, I, I think it's important because I use. That's why I use this notion. So, uh, the reason that I use that quote about Queequeg to open the book is because uh, late. Late Foucault argues that transitional subjectivity is an actual subjectivity, and he says in these lectures that it's an entire field of study that, that no one has like embarked upon yet. Right? He's like, there's an entire way to kind of understand unstable subjectivity. And so my argument in the book is that in order to do that, we have to create an instrument, a philosophical tool that allows us to witness uh, subjects in motion and freeze them long enough to be able to witness exactly what's going on. Right? It's like, Biologically, it's like the transition from, from caterpillar to butterfly. There's all kinds of stuff going on when it's inside that cocoon we don't get to really witness. And now, you know, it's because of science, we can actually see what's going on in there, like liquefies itself, it changes in all these kinds of different ways, right? So my argument is that 
the plantation in constantly destabilizing the subjectivity of blacks of black individuals, right? You're always everything's at stake, right? This is uh, I mentioned Jesse Orlando Patterson, his book, Slavery and Social Death, right? It's, everything's you're always one step away from being dead, right? It's, it's like bare life in the Agamian sense of the term, right? It's only you're only functioning in order to to just live. And so that's a type of unstable existence because what we find is that subjects of the time, place, and, and methodology of their death are not human in certain ways. Right? This is the argument of the death row inmate, et cetera, et cetera. Right? I know next Tuesday at 3 p.m. they're gonna kill me, so I live completely differently in that way. Right? So my argument is that the black subjectivity, the plantation is designed to create that. And so in, in understanding that, it also doesn't mean that we can't understand it. We have to develop a different kind of tool in order to be able to witness it. And so Morrison does this in, 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 uh, in Beloved, where she, she talks about the enslaved person who time won't work the way he wants it to, right? He walks to go meet this woman he loves, and by the time he gets there, he has to turn around, right? Because he's unstable in that kind of way. He can't control his actual uh, social life and, his, and that socialized relationship to temporality. So he lived, lives a kind of destabilized existence, but it's actually stably unstable, right? So it's like watching, uh, you know, like a gyroscope, right? That as it's about to fall over, it's spinning around its axis and it's wobbling, but it also has a particular type of momentum. That is actually a thing to kind of observe. My argument is that that physically is about what it looks like to be black in America, right? I was interested, there was a couple of students of mine when we did Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad, and that yeah. same thing with temporality, temporality, and this quest of freedom that is unending, sure. and, just, and then an instinction between North and South, um, the way racism works and that sort of muddling of it, it soon connects down with this idea. So that transitioning stuff is maybe like late Foucault. I was also thinking, yeah. I was kind of thinking Deleuze, because you also mentioned Absolutely. Kafka, and I was thinking minor literature and stuff like that, but it's, yeah. Yeah, it's Deleuze, and it's, it's this kind of, you know, with the lose and the thousand plateaus, it's this notion of, of unending masking. There's always some other mask behind it. You know, so then you pick up all these kind of you know poetic tropes as well, right? But the notion of being unstable, you know, uncomfortable, comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Always in some fraught type of uh, situation is actually in a situation. So that's the kind of argument that I'm making, and I and I think that the plantation, as well as the camp, later both exemplify that across kind of time and space and, and the, it creates a particular type of political or social subjectivity. I'll start with Karen. Uh, when you say that that the Black subjectivity is unstable, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that Sure. Yeah, I make a, I use a lot of Benito Serino in the book because there's a uh, there's a chapter. It's called Othello the Negro. That's the longest kind of middle chapter. And it basically runs from Othello uh, to Benito Serino to Invisible Man, and like this kind of arguing that this is a continuum. So, uh, and this is where I use the the I didn't plant this question. This is, this is where I use the, the Martin Elliott project because. Uh, Two things I learned is that I underline stuff way too much in the books that I read, and like you know, it's very succinct. So he he marks that one passage where he talks about uh, where Othello's looking at Desdemona and says, "I think she's uh, true. I think she's you know he's it's unstable with respect to the way he understands what she's doing, right?" And my argument is that that uh, that is what is actually going on in Benito Serino, where it's un, it's unclear to him, particularly when he's dealing with Atafal. When he witnesses him and can't and sees him as this kind of noble figure, but also sees that he's enslaved, right? And can't just turn the corner and, and realize that this is all something that's playing itself out. And it's also a temporal shift because if you recall, if you pay care. I was in. A, I went to the naval academy, so I was in the navy. So the bell system on on the ships doesn't function properly, right? The, the ship's bells are ringing kind of completely out of sequence when he first gets there. It makes no sense what time of day it is. What 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 bell is ringing? So he's signaling that this is kind of. Uh, Alice in Wonderland temporality that's happening on board the ship, and it's because it's been taken over and it's existing outside of the, the uh, normative requirements of white societal order. And he can't understand it until he jumps off, and as he jumps off, it says time returned to him, and he realized immediately it strikes him like lightning what exactly has been going on. So Benio Serino is actually, 
in many ways, exemplar of this. And then Ellison opens Invisible Man with the last lines of Benito Sereno. And my argument is that what he's doing there is saying that that last line where he says, you know, uh, the Negro, he replaces that with the Invisible Man because he excises, Ellison excises that line, just continues with the story and opens with, you know, I'm an Invisible Man, basically. So I think there's a continuum there. And I think Benito Sereno is kind of hinged between, and Melville's work is a hinge between what I think, uh, I read Shakespeare is probably the best English language political theorist, period. You know, because what he does in Othello with respect to kind of race, uh, misogyny, et cetera, et cetera, is, is miscegenation on and on, is, is, you know, reads today as it did, you know, when he wrote it, right? So I think it's a, a critical kind of way station between the two that then allows you to get to Ellison and what Ellison carefully understands as the implication of Benito Cervino and this unstable existence that, that can't find a place to land itself. Because they ask, you know, they're trying to find their way back to some place and they can't get there. They can't become a, a Senegalese ship. They can't become an African flag ship and just sail and be free on the high seas any longer. So it's, it's only on the ship with its function, so it's unstable. Yes. Michael, thank you for this wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start with an observation uh, apropos of your conversation with Ralph, especially mm -hmm. the question about the unstable subject. As the stable subject, uh, I, as, you were, as you guys were uh, talking, uh, discussing, it came to mind that uh, apart from Foucault and Deleuze, uh, Fanon would be a great example who talks about how the condition of being black is actually caught between white, which you cannot be, and black, which does not exist. So you basically inhabit a lack of non-being. Right. Um, and uh, so I, that was coming to my mind, and I thought that was fascinating the way it resonated with uh, what you were saying. My question actually was uh, something uh, about something with which you began or prefaced your presentation. Uh, I think you introduced this uh, that as a methodological argument, uh, namely the context of decolonizing the curriculum. Sure. Uh, and you said that the two broad ways this is happening, one is subtraction, almost going back to Ngugi, decolonize that classroom, got nothing to do with it. Right. Uh, but the methodological alternative of adding new writers, as problematic as it might be, who gets added from the so-called non-West, uh, and alternative methods of reading, for example, critical race theory. Right. Uh, so I, being invested in this uh, conversation of decolonizing the curriculum here in my institution and at other places, am wondering how much of that initial part of subtracting the Ngugi way of thinking, uh, is, was, how much of that was a rhetorical gesture for you mm -hmm. to lead on to your main argument that we have to read differently? Right. Uh, because Gayatri Spivak doesn't agree that we have to do away with European writing at all. She mm -hmm. calls herself a Europeanist. Uh, Minolo says we do not have to do away with modernity. Think of modernity as transmodernity where barbarians have contributed. So I'm just curious if this is something you've experienced in your professional field where there is this insistence on subtracting instead of reviewing and repurposing, which I believe is exactly what you were doing, making sure. it more the more richer. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, uh, it's, I think it's anecdotal from my perspective, but I think it kind of holds together. I tell students all the time, they come to me and they'll say, you know, I want to be an English major, because I'm in both race and mm -hmm. migration studies and the English department, so a student come to me and it's an English project, and they're like, but I want to do it in REM because I don't want to read a bunch of like old white guys. And I'll say to them, I'm like, well, two things, right? I went to Jesuit high school, Naval Academy, University of Chicago, and Brown. So I'm not in Gookie. You know, I can't argue that I'm some, you know, from outer space, some distant subject. So, but the I can't. The substantive argument is you can't transgress boundaries if you don't understand it, right? Like, so I think that the I think it, it increases the work and doubles or triples the work mm -hmm. of of that type of project of decolonization. And, and let's just call it postcolonial theory of literature for the sake of argument. As a kind of a placeholder. Mm -hmm. I think that what it means is that you have to understand the canon. You have to be conversant in it in order to be able to transgress it. Otherwise, you're just playing around at the margins, right? So it's a kind of additional. And I think that this speaks to the way that ethnic studies is often situated as a place that people go who can't do anything else. I think it's actually a more difficult practice in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just in, in this reading, right, it's like you've got, you know, 
you've got Plato, Melville, Fanon, Deleuze, Foucault, you know, James Brown probably, right? I can figure out all kinds of ways to kind of think about this in, 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 in multiple in multiple registers. So that's kind of my argument. And I and I in, in my pedagogical practice I kind of say this as well, right? It's like we're not gonna replace, you know, the kind of reductive argument from the perspective of the kind of hard liners is, you know, we're gonna get rid of Shakespeare and it's gonna be Spike Lee movies from now till, you know, the end of time. But no one's no one's saying that. Yeah. Right? And so I think that it's it's a I think if if we focus on it from that positionality, right, we'll do both of them and it's just more work and just you just have to accept that. I think that's the way I've always attacked it, and I think it's been useful. Just it helps me resolve some of these questions. As yeah, well. absolutely. That's precisely the thing. I mean, the other side that do away with everything almost appears to exist in some quarters as a misunderstanding of what decolonization of the curriculum really means. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I think in Benengue also, you know, I don't have a language or a place in the way. And this is, you know, when I was at Brown, this was the last couple of years of of Achebe being there. And this was kind of an argument between the two of them because the question was always, you know, for Chepe is why don't you write Igbo? His argument was I possess both languages equally and I can use them both. And he, he was not trying to do violence to Ngugi's argument. He's saying I, I'm, uh, it's a different type of practice for him. So I kind of get both of those. If I had it my own language, I could probably pull a stuff like that, but I can't. And Ngugi's in a different position now. Only. As is, as is Gaiji Spivak, from an African-American thinker is in a, in a particularly different African, Afro, Caribbean, Afro, South, you know, particularly different yeah. experience. So. Our time's up. Thanks for the good questions. Thank you, Michael, for uh, oh, thank you. your thought.